we move to the presentation from Farm Credit Canada, I want to take a couple of moments to say a few words about Michael Hoffert, President and CEO of FCC. As many of you probably know, Michael has told us he's retiring in June. So Michael has really created a legacy in Canadian ag. His dedication and passion for Canadian ag and Canadian farmers is absolutely unquestionable. With 30 years of ag finance experience, Michael has seen Canadian ag and agri-food grow, and he's helped us along. Starting as a relationship manager, Michael served eventually as vice president of partners and channels and prairie operations. He was FCC's first chief risk officer, which I understand was a big deal in the day. And then in 2014, Michael was appointed president and CEO, a legacy indeed. And Michael and FCC have been exceptional friends to CFA. So Michael, it's with great pleasure I ask you to come up today. I do wanna say you will be missed, but uh, we all wish you very well and the very best in your future endeavors. And we hope you're going to stay in touch. You're not going to disappear. You have told me you'll come to PEI and have some lobster and beer. So that's good. Gotcha. Yes. Thank you okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in Ottawa and to have this opportunity to have a discussion with all of the participants of uh, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture. Here, um, as Mary said, uh, I would like to thank the CFA for the opportunity to address uh, your national convention for the final time in my role as president and CEO of Farm Credit, uh, Farm Credit Canada. Uh, I've been here several times, had the opportunity to be on the stage several times, and uh, believe it or not, I had a much uh, fuller head of hair the first time that I, I had the chance to be here. But after 34 years of service and eight years as the president and CEO, I've decided to retire in, in, um, in June of 2022. And this is where I'd like to begin my comments. Uh, to outline the contrast between the industry and organization that I joined in 1988, and the economic powerhouse uh, the industry has become today, and to leave you with some comments to contemplate regarding the future. Looking back at 1988, the Canadian agriculture industry was at the height of the farm debt crisis. Canadian farmers were hit with a perfect storm of higher debt leverage built up after some very profitable and optimistic years uh, throughout the late 1970s and early 1980s colliding with subsequent years of double-digit interest rates uh, to address that inflation. FCC was the, uh, remarkably the best deal in the block at 16% interest rates at one time. Multiple years of below normal production and commodity prices that remained doggedly low, even in the face of limited supplies. The resulting collapse in farmland values and cash flow shortfalls resulted in thousands of producers selling out or quit claiming their lands to resolve unsustainable debts. For many, it didn't matter how smart or effective you were as an operator. If you started farming in the early 1980s, you struggled for sure and you were lucky to make it. When I started with FCC, I had no idea of the magnitude of the situation. That the organization would eventually be managing over 1.5 million acres of farmland on leasebacks to former owners, that the portfolio would shrink to under $4 billion, and that the government of Canada would need to inject $1.2 billion to recapitalize the organization before passing new legislation with a focus on oper operating with a goal of commercial sustainability for both FCC and the industry that we serve. To say the least, the difficult conversations I had at kitchen tables with my customers left a mark on me and has guided me throughout my career at FCC on the responsibility that I and my organization has to this industry. Happier note. <laughs> Fast forward to 2022. The industry is strong and resilient. In a year of production 
and shortfalls and challenges in many areas, strong prices have supported farm cash receipts. Record Canadian agriculture and food exports. We have a strong Canadian agriculture balance sheet. And something forgotten during the pandemic, macroeconomic drivers of increasing populations and middle classes continue to march forward, leading to expectations of commodity prices that should support profitability even in a time of rising input costs. FCC now has approximately 100,000 customers, farms, agribusiness, and egg food processors, $44 billion in loans, a robust suite of lending products, knowledge offer, and a Canadian agriculture's number one farm management software. As the Canadian agriculture industry goes, so goes FCC. The organization's balance sheet is strong and, sufficient pro and we are sufficiently profitable to continue to invest in new products and services that the agriculture and food industry will need in the decades to come. Oh, excuse me. The story of Canadian agriculture and food industry over the past 30 years is nothing short of remarkable. And every CFA member in this room or listening across the country should take a lot of pride in where the industry is at. Are there challenges to resolve? Absolutely. However, I look at where we have come from and the opportunities ahead, and I'm 100% confident we can achieve anything we set our sights on collectively. So in my final address to this assembly, I thought about what message I would want to leave you to consider as you plan out the future for the CFA and the broader agriculture and food industry that you represent. For today, I would like to share three thoughts under the headings of Keep, Grow, and Accelerate. My subject of the first category of Keep may surprise some, but is one of the greatest competitive advantages we have in Canada, and it's the family farm. Owned and operated family farm enterprises are a competitive advantage that should not be taken for granted. A few years ago, I saw a report, a paper that came from the US, that suggested the family farm was a lock for the next generation, but after about 2040, the future was less than sure. And the report caused me to think about Canada and to consider some of those pressures that could be behind the hypothesis of this report and formulate the business case and the ideas to support the long-term success of family-owned and operated farming operations in Canada. I've I can't imagine another business structure that could contribute to Canada's competitive advantage like the family farm. Having the same gumption and stick to itness, and those are technical words, to withstand what we've lived through in the last two years and still generate record revenue for the sector as a whole is simply incredible. Family farms are foundational to our industry and to rural communities across Canada. The very nature of the family-owned business, where owners are not only work, but live, is near impossible to replicate. Generational businesses with a balanced focus on near-term profitability and long-term sustainability. A commitment and a care for land and livestock that is inherent in the design. Unlike publicly traded companies, a family farm doesn't have to beat the street every quarter. And like one of my colleagues, Todd Klink, likes to say, is one of the few businesses with a focus on the next quarter century. On the question of size, small, medium and large family owned operations can all be successful. Multi-generational and multi-family operations are increasingly the norm. Optimizing the talents and interests of the family members from agronomists to animal health specialists to marketers and financial managers all are needed and is often more than one, one person can stay on top of. In a war for talent and labor, having the equity stake in the results of your labor is a game changer for continuity and commitment. The face of the family farm in Canada is also changing as the demographics of our nation evolve. Long tenured farm families are being joined by new entrants, often with diversity of background and more recently, including Indigenous peoples and First Nations, which is also great, all adding to the richness and ingenuity of our sector. So with all the strengths in the family farm model, why would I raise this as an asset to protect? 
In short, the investment cost of our farm, or excuse me, the investment cost of our farms continues to rise. And as the pace of investment in new technology and equipment and facilities accelerates, what got us here may not get us where we need to go. Do I think the future requires us to rethink how we transition some of these increasingly complex and valuable farming operations? I have to share that the answer is yes. The thought of each generation taking decades to fully buy out the financial interests of the one before will be increasingly difficult. This approach diverts resources from business critical investments to move business forward and stay competitive in a challenging operating environment. To be clear, this is not a five alarm fire and we have time to figure it out. But I wanna raise it today so that we're thinking about options that will make tomorrow easier to manage and no matter the operating environment, we can be successful. Maybe we can learn from some of those successful family enterprises outside of agriculture. Those strong multi-generational family enterprises that are successfully navigating the transition riddle between generation to generation. And this is a we challenge. Solutions will need to come from organizations like the one I lead at FCC. We all will need to support the industry and the family farm model in the future. And I just wanted to put it out there as something to protect and keep. In the category of grow, my next category, I have the value added and domestic food processing sectors. We've talked a lot about uh, the Barton report uh, issued five years ago, and I can remember Dominic Barton, many of you would have been here, when he came and addressed this very assembly and to outline what was in its report. And I would argue that his recommendations to make the agriculture and food industry a key pillar of the Canadian economy and economic engine uh, still remains extremely relevant. And we have the opportunity to grow our value-added sector and really achieve its full potential. In 2016, Dominic Barton challenged our industry to reach that $75 billion in agriculture and food exports by 2025. And it was shared earlier by the minister today that remarkably Canada hit 74 billion in 2020 and our FCC economics team had reported recently that Canada reached $82.7 billion of ag and food exports in 2021. This means we shattered that original $75 billion goal four years ahead of schedule and we're also well on our way to achieving the $85 billion goal that was set by Murad Al-Khatib and a number of individuals that joined him on the Ag Food Strategy Roundtable. A key contributor to Canada hitting these important economic goals is the growth in our value-added activities. Looking at it from a GDP perspective, Canada's agriculture and food industry GDP is now $140 billion, with $32 billion generated from value-added processing and corresponding sales. A few short years ago, our GDP in egg and food was $110 billion in 2017, just to give you an idea of the growth, and it was much more heavily weighted in raw agriculture production. And I would argue that the best is yet to come. From a Canadian economic perspective, the business case for value-added processing is the multiplier effect. Recently, I was in a meeting where a major food processor shared for every dollar that they spent on capital for a new plant or an expansion, another $3 was invested on Canadian farms and related service industries. And that did not include the annual economic activity derived from the ongoing operations and the strengthening of the national, national supply chains. With a strong agri-food processing sector being a key contributor to the strong primary agriculture industry and overall economic health of nations, it's little wonder why the competition is so fierce to attract these investments to regions across North America and internationally. We have some amazing momentum though. Just in the greater Regina area where the FCC head office is located, there's been almost $4 billion in recent announcements of investments that are gonna happen in that region. Straw plants, canola crush facilities, biodiesel. And this doesn't include the new oat and flax processing facilities that were just uh, quietly completed and opened by private companies within the region. This type of positive investment in value-added operations is taking a place across the country. And I know this group is from all over and you can just think of all of the things that are happening. It's real and it's taking place. So how do we keep this momentum going? Well, I'm not above stealing. So, uh, you know, based on a famous uh, business book, I would say we need to stay hungry, we need to stay humble, and we need to stay smart. 
From a hungry perspective, attracting and retaining agribusiness and agri-food processors is going to take a coordinated approach nationally, provincially, and municipally. If we want to see these businesses come and succeed, they need to feel it and they need to experience it. Infrastructure, roads, rail, ample access to fresh water, and wastewater processing are all a must. Access to skilled labour, just had a great panel on that. Competitive cost structures and a hunger to nurture existing businesses and welcome new businesses with a solid concierge type service experience is the new norm. Humble, well we do that pretty well as Canadians, but being humble means never taking our competitive advantage for granted. We need to shine a light on that competitive advantage and continue to grow it. On a category of smart, continually assessing the needs of our agribusiness processors and egg food uh, organizations and adapting and growing to meet their evolving needs. And this is also where organizations like FCC, we need to play a part. Ensuring access to capital is, is readily available from equity and mezzanine financing of early stage companies right up to a subordinate and senior debt organ for organizations that are growing and thriving. There's a lot of great momentum going into this space and we will need to continue to uh, grow it to reach our country's full potential. And finally, under the banner of Accelerate is the potential for the agriculture and food industry to be one of Canada's most sustainable industries. This feels fitting given the theme of today's AGM is finding sustainable solutions in times of uncertainty. You know, the, the, the three panels this morning were simply outstanding. Just excellent information. Uh, really, I think, brought to light some of the, the opportunities, but also the challenges in a very complex environment. Sustainability is a big, broad topic. Protecting our, our water, our soils, our biodiversity, and of course, managing our industry's carbon footprint, where we have, are all areas that we have a role to play. With the egg and food industry accounting for 7-8% of Canada's GDP, but approximately 10-11% to of our nation's carbon emissions, it's natural that there's going to be expectations. But this said, agriculture is one of the very few industries where carbon management and opportunity can be discussed in the same sentence. My rationale for putting sustainability in the accelerate category is that I feel that we're spinning to some degree and our challenge may be that we're going to need to target progress versus perfection so that we can move forward and create some momentum. And history shows that we have a foundation to build upon. I showed this video the very first time I addressed this committee, whatever that would have been, 2014. And this is a, uh, a, a video of, of uh, 1988, you can see in May, and, it's, and the dust is blowing. And, and I remember as an FCC employee in that drought year of 88, and even more so in the spring of 89, with these amazing dust storms that were happening. It wasn't the 30s, it was the 80s. And a, uh, they were like snowstorms when you're driving across the highway. And at the time, if you were looking for topsoil, you could go to a fence line and you could find it and take it home for your garden, because a lot of it had kind of uh, packed up there like snow banks. And it's just not the way of the world anymore. And, and uh, you know, we've made some incredible progresses. Today, when we experienced the same weather and the same winds in the spring of 2021, it was a really great example of what could have been a, a, a very difficult search situation. The prairie skies were almost always clear. They're almost always blue. And the topsoil stayed safely in place. And it's an amazing good news story. No-till technology has resulted in prairie soils, organic matter improving steadily for the past 30 years. With the organic matter in many fields now very similar to what it would have been the day it was broke by those that would have uh, colonized our country. The opportunity to build on success stories like this are real and the opportunity to get paid for it, these practices should be and I believe will be part of our future. I've been watching with interest what's been taking place in the US where hundreds of thousands of acres are enrolled in carbon sequestration programs with farmers being paid for their practices. In Canada, the recent announcement of the 183 million Government of Canada on-farm climate action fund should get us off to a good start with funding for everything from intercropping to nutrient management, rotational grazing, all to kind of improve our practices. We heard it earlier today about provinces like Alberta and I've read about the province of Quebec and others that are also introducing new programs, which is really helpful and I'd like to give a shout out to the CFA for your Canadian Agri-Food Sustainability Initiative because all these things make a difference. They all contribute. 
And to really accelerate, I feel it's going to take industry and on-farm ingenuity to take things to the next level. Sustainability is going to look different in all parts of Canada and in different sectors. And that's to be expected in such a vast country. By example, the Canadian Dairy Farmers of Canada recently announced their commitment to achieve net zero by 2050, on, uh, building on the success of reducing their sector's carbon footprint by 24% since 1990. A great example of thinking global and acting local. The Canadian Cattlemen Certif Certif uh, Certified Sustainable Beef Program now represents just under 20% of Canada's total production. This is a great example of the industry coming forward with a verifiable production model that meets the needs of ranchers, processors, restaurants, and ultimately consumers. And the potential of circular agriculture models such as plant protein production, where the ingredients are being extracted for human food, are complemented by byproducts being upcycled into animal feed for poultry, hogs, and cattle, are all great ways to reduce food waste and optimize efficiency, and they're all going to need to be part of our future. To, find, to achieve our full potential of egg technology, as we've already heard today, is also going to be tremendous. To really accelerate our sustainability journey, we're going to need to adopt or uh, develop technology that creates those triple wins. Technology that can help us grow more, manage our costs, and while also providing big wins on the sustainability front. And those no-till practices are a great example of, of what we've done in the past. And I believe these technologies are out there. And picking and supporting these winners is a place where government, academia, and of course the industry and people in this room are going to play such an important role. Sustainable production and a strong agriculture economy go hand in hand. And the ultimate environmentalists are the farmers and ranchers across Canada, and that is you. I believe the solutions are in this room. And my encouragement is that we accelerate our efforts at scale and solidify the agriculture and food industry as Canada's most sustainable industry. I'd like to leave you with one last thought, and that is on the subject of the power of partnership. I feel it's particularly appropriate for the CFA as you set the tone in this area for others to follow. A federation of producer groups, associations from across Canada, coming together to move the agriculture industry forward. You live the power of partnership each and every day. You know, Mary, Keith, Todd, all of the folks in this room, you, your role in the power of partnership is so invaluable. Let's continue to build on these existing partnerships and broaden the tent with new relationships to make our industry unstoppable. I've seen firsthand what can happen when the Canadian agri and food industry comes together. This past week, FCC announced the results of our annual driveway hunger food drive. Coming together in a, as an industry-wide effort, 36 million meals were raised for food banks across Canada. That is almost one meal for each and every Canadian and over a 100% increase from the previous year's efforts. It's a small example of what's possible when we come together as one industry. So I'd like to end by thanking you for your leadership I'd like to thank you for all that you do to feed Canadians and citizens around this world. And just together, anything is possible. Have a great conference. Merci beaucoup et bonne journée. Thank you.